Welcome, and my name is Anne. I'm the Director of Education here at Billy and Oyster Project. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Agata. I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator here at the Billy and Oyster Project. But today, I am Miss Frizzle, and we will be talking about the spooky, creepy critters of New York Harbor. And I am a piece of algae floating in the harbor. So thank you so much for joining us at Creepy Critters. We're really excited to be here and show off some of the critters that lurk in the waters of New York Harbor. And in this short hour, we'll have a special guest from the Brooklyn Children's Museum, as well as a live broadcast of some really creepy critters from our crew up at the Baylander ship on the Hudson River. We'll have some time for questions and answers so feel free to use the Q&A function located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And at the end of this event, we'll have a special surprise and we'll have a very important scientific research survey that you get to fill out. So before we dive into all those exciting things, Agata, what's your favorite creepy critter? My favorite creepy critter has got to be a spider crab. So a spider crab has these really long arms and they always look really muddy and gross, but it's actually really amazing because the spider crab will take bits and pieces of what's around it. So on this spider crab here, you can see sea squirts growing on it. You can see different tunicates and he uses that to cover himself and also act as camouflage. Spider crabs are not really aggressive um, or anything like that, so you should, don't worry about getting pinched by them. And they're really cool because they'll actually walk around the harbor floor in this camouflage and they'll consume the little bits and pieces of the dead organisms that are there. So they're basically nature's sanitation department. Super cool. I love them. But when they run around and walk, ugh, that creeps me out. <laughs> and what about you? What's your favorite creepy critter? Well, I love the spider crab, but my favorite creepy critter is the blue crab. If you take a look at this blue crab, you can see those pointy red claws. Blue crabs can be really tough. They can pinch and they can even draw blood, but they're beautiful. As they come to be adults, they have beautiful blue on their back. And another cool thing about them is that the back legs are actually little paddles. They're called swimmerettes. And they help the blue crab, unlike other crabs in the harbor, actually get up off the bottom of the harbor and swim around a little bit. Another cool thing about blue crabs 
is that by looking at the bottom of their carapace, you can tell the difference between a male blue crab and a female blue crab. So that's one of my favorites. But we're not gonna only talk about critters that are in New York Harbor. We're also gonna show off some creepy critters with our friends over at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Shakira, are you there over at the museum? Hi guys, how are you? Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. So, my name is Shakira, and I am the animal coordinator at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Sorry, Absolutely. I'm trying to balance this animal that I actually have in my arm right now. Oh, well, let's get right to your creepy critter. All right, guys. So I'm going to just stand up and get really close to this camera. And this is a Chilean rosy hair tarantula. Now its habitat, a habitat is a place where an animal lives, are the deserts of Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. This guy is somewhat special because he has a growth cycle. And the way that he starts off is egg, and then he hatches and it'll turn into a little spiderling. And then it'll turn into a full adult. But he's special because he molts. That means that he will then let go of his entire uh, bone, his exoskeleton on the outside. And that allows him to get even bigger. This is a female and I can tell because this little area right here, she's crawling all the way up, <laughs> is her abdomen. And abdomens in females are actually very big. In males, it stays very small. She can live up to 20 years old and she eats grasshoppers, moths, beetles, roaches, lizards, and even small mammals. Now, this is my creepiest animal that I have here for you today, but some people say, oops, she's on my shirt. <laughs> some people say that uh, lizards or reptiles are their creepy animal. So I'm gonna take, give you a good look at this one and I'm going to then take out my other one. Wow, that tarantula is beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tarantula, for playing along. <laughs> she was very cooperative. I love that. This mm -hmm. is a bearded dragon. And a lot of people do not like reptiles at all. Mostly snakes. Reptiles, uh, lizards, they get, people can actually stand a little bit more because they actually have legs. But they are related because they both have scales. A amongst other things that they have in common, of course. Now this is called a bearded dragon because if she or he, sorry, were to get a little bit angry or was trying to find a girlfriend, this portion of the jaw will turn all black, making it look like a beard. Now this guy comes from Australia, <coughs> arid places, meaning very dry places, um, subtropical places, woodlands, and even shrub areas. This guy eats bugs, small mammals like mice, fruits and veggies. And if you can tell, he's a little bit on the pudgy side. So he eats all of his food. His lifespan is about 10 to 15 years. And it all depends on uh, the conditions that you keep him in. Now his growth cycle also starts with egg. He then hatches, he turns into a juvenile, which is just kind of like a baby uh, bearded dragon, turns into a teenager, and then turns into a full grown adult like this one right here. Now, the way that he gets bigger is he also sheds, but he doesn't shed in one piece. He sheds in multiple pieces. So if you see like uh, right now, he's not shedding, maybe his tail a little bit, uh, but he will shed into very big, uh, large pieces. Unlike us, you'll never see us shed, although we do. Wow, he is beautiful. Does he have a name? This guy's called uh, Spike Jeremy. <laughs> he has two names. Uh, because when we went to name him, uh, we gave the museum the option of naming him and uh, we already had a spike, so we had to give him a second name. So Jeremy was the one that everyone picked. Very nice. So we have a couple of questions coming in from our audience. Uh, one of the questions is about the spider. That's a tarantula, is that correct? You are correct. It is a tarantula. It is a rose-haired tarantula. 
So there are, are there different types of tarantulas? There are many different types of tarantulas, too many for me to name because I don't have them all memorized, but there are at least, I think like 60 to 100, I'm not too sure. And they're, they're always finding new ones every single year. Wow. And then there's even a lot more spiders, which are a little bit different. They're, they tend to be a little bit lighter. And is that spider soft and fuzzy? It's a little hard to tell on the video what, what its body is like. It is, it's made up of a whole bunch of hairs all over the body, um, but those hairs, you never want to touch or pick up a tarantula just like I did, unless you're like an expert, which I am not. I just know how to handle them. Um, but those hairs actually are a self-defense mechanism and that's something that an animal has to protect itself. And if you, she were to let go of those hairs, it'll make you itch immensely. And that's how it protects itself. It lets go of those hairs and it'll get in the eyes, the nose and the mouth of the predator that's trying to eat her. And then while they are too busy trying to scratch away that itch, she can then run away. Wow. And does the, a lot of people are uh, afraid of the tarantula. Hello, Spike Jeremy. Um, <laughs> but does, does that rose haired tarantula also bite or have some kind of poison? Yes, yeah, so another self-defense mechanism that actually all animals have is the ability to bite, right? So she actually has fangs and with fangs usually comes poison. Now, the one that I have, if she were to bite me, it would only feel like a bee sting, um, but there are other tarantulas and other spiders that are very poisonous, so that's why I recommend never to touch any, and um, that can actually kill you. So that's my recommendation. Do not touch any spider or tarantula. And does the bearded dragon have any sort of venom or poison? This one, no, not at all. There are some lizards that do. Um, but this bearded dragon does not have any poison. The only thing that he has is a, a mean bite, uh, but a lot of people get these as a first pet because they're very docile. He's very tolerant of me and other humans. Um, so yeah, he, he's harmless. And do tarantulas make good pets? Because I feel like I've sometimes seen them as pets. Um, a lot of people have them as pets. Usually they start off with something else, maybe like a lizard. I will never recommend for you to get a tarantula as your first pet unless you um, research them and have a little bit of experience with an other animal first because they do take a lot of care. Absolutely. And if folks come over to the Brooklyn Children's Museum, can they see Spike Jeremy and the rose-haired tarantula on display? So these guys are used for educational purposes, like what I'm doing right now. Um, I take them out randomly. I do walk the floor with them. We do use them for programs, but you won't be able to see them on exhibit, although there are other animals on exhibit, turtles, toads, roaches. Um, so yeah, you'll be able to see those type of animals, just not this guy. Wonderful. Well, Shakira, thank you so much for being here live with us. And thank you to Spike Jeremy. And thank you to the rose-haired tarantula. What a treat to see these amazing animals live. Thank you guys for having me. And you guys have a wonderful rest day. Take care, Shakira. Woo, that was so spooky. Oh my God, the tarantula when it was crawling up on Shakira's like shirt there. Oh, geez. Yeah, Woo. it's I mean, so great to see what's going on, isn't it? Yeah, so cool. And the bearded dragon, yes, I agree with the audience. Very, very handsome fellow, that one. Just hanging out on her hand like that. So cool. I'm very happy to have seen all of that stuff from behind the scenes at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Um, and I'm really excited uh, for our little sneak peek a little bit later. We're gonna have a little bit of a surprise with the Brooklyn Children's Museum at the very end of this webinar. So keep, stick to it and stay with us. But for now, we have another surprise for you. We are going to take you over to Baylander where we have some of our educational staff working and they're gonna introduce themselves and we're gonna see what kind of creepy critters they might find there at Baylander. Okay, relax. Hello, 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 spooky friends out there. So 
So my name is Tanasia, and I'm at the Baylander. Rubina is behind the camera right now. But I also wanted to introduce some of my friends here at the Baylander. And then we're going to get into our creepy critters. So Scott and Ira, you guys can introduce yourselves and talk about like what you do. And let's we can get right into it. OK. Uh, my name's Scott. I'm the captain of the Baylander, Scott Keon. Uh, I started working on the river in 1984. Uh, it's been the love of my life. Uh, I, what we do here is we do a combination of, I worked at the Intrepid for 20, I worked at Pier 66, so the idea was to blend the two. It was the idea is, you know, you do a museum, you do educational, but then you also give people some food, which is something <laughs> maybe three times a day. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick it on out to Ira, who's been our citizen scientist since we moved in here. He, he, he showed up on, a, on like the second day that we were here, and next thing you know, Billion Oyster Program exploded. Here you go, Ira. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, my name is Ira Gershenhorn, and I'm the citizen scientist here. I have about 10 oyster research stations, which I have on a cycle. I pull them out, and I think I've checked everyone here about three times this year so far. I was fortunate to find this place, but my first oyster research station was stolen. It was right about back behind Marina here. So um, that's it. Yeah, awesome. So we're going to get right into our creepy critters. So as mentioned, Ira has some RSs here. And the cool thing, so the Baylander is right on the Hudson. So the cool thing about this location is the critters that we find here that I don't normally find in the East River. So these are critters. I'm going to show you just a photo of the critter before we actually get into the real one. Um, so here's a, a photo, an image of an isopod. So as you can see, they look pretty weird. And they're isopods, so iso meaning same, and pod just meaning their their leg. So essentially, they use their legs and little swimmers to swim around. And let's get right into it. So in this tank here, I pulled this up, you know, about five minutes ago. In this tank, we have a few different critters, including the isopod. Now these things sort of creep me out, <laughs> but I'm gonna take a spoon so you can get a closer look. So usually they swim around using their legs, as mentioned. And let's see if I can pull a few of them up. Okay, so we have a crab on one end. Let's see if I can get a big one so that you guys can get a better view. All right. Please don't drop it. <laughs> so there we go. So we have some isopods here. And as you can see, they have various little legs and things that they use to swim around and propel themselves. And they're closely related to the pill bug. So the pill bug, which is normally on land, you can see his little, you know, legs, they're moving. They, they never bite. They, they're pretty gentle, they don't bite. So I, I know some folks so, so. think of them as roaches, but they're essentially like pill bugs, <laughs> but marine pill bugs. That's a mud crab right there. The mud crabs don't bite either. The, the blue points bite. That guy will bite. <laughs> this, this, this guy won't. If they hold their claws in close to themselves, they won't bite. If they hold their claws out, then they're aggressive. And they have these little short, stubby claws on them. And so the isopods, a cool little fact about the isopods is that they actually could eat oysters when they're in the larval state. So when oysters spawn and then the larvae of the oyster are swimming around in the harbor, isopods can eat them when they're swimming around and at that larval state. Now, Ira, as mentioned, he's one of the citizen scientists here, and he's played a large role in keeping up with the RSs, learning about these critters. And I know, Ira, you're working with a scientist in Connecticut, right? That's correct. I posted photos of these uh, critters to iNaturalist, and uh, someone uh, saw them in the local community. And there was a big uh, discussion on iNaturalist of what they were. And apparently they are some sort of invasive species that is not native here. It only lives in estuaries. Yeah, so they're pretty cool. So if I would say this is one of the creepy critters that you find right here in the Hudson at the Baylander. So if you're free, feel free to pull up your RS if it's all along the Hudson. See if you can find any of those isopods that's there. We have about, I want to say we have about like 30 or, or even more isopods inside of this tank here, including a few uh, sea squirts. They're also sort of like creepy critters as well. 
We have some C squirts as well. And C squirts, they have these like two little siphons. You can see it here. And they essentially squirt water if you squeeze them a bit. So these are a tunicate also found here at the Baylander. A snail? Yes, you got really? two snails. Yeah. Oh. We have some mud snails here. Unusual. So these are mud snails. And they're found also, we found them around, like normally if you're in a, a marshland or usually just walking where the water is low, or the tide is low, you usually find them. And if you're not looking close enough, they can look like rocks, but they're mud snails. So you can see the diversity of the different critters here, right at the Baylanders. You have the isopod, the mud crab, the mud snail, all in one. And, and these all come off of the cage. These all come off These of the These are the first cages. mud snails I've ever seen here. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, I've never yeah. seen them. They, uh, they all come off the BOP cage. The BOP cage, most people don't realize, is a it's a condo for critters. <laughs> <laughs> Every really small is. animal that's looking for a place to live, nobody wants to live in Kansas, but if you put up a building, then people that all want to live into it, and it's the same thing with oyster cages. All these other small creatures all of a sudden find structure that they can hide, they can live, and they can thrive. And that's one of the most interesting and important things about the Billion Oyster Program is the fact that it's creating biodiversity in the water column. So normally the isopods, I think you had a question about how isopods essentially protect themselves. So the isopods, although they're pretty, they're, they're pretty, uh, they're like, like slimy, but they have sort of like a hard exoskeleton. Skeleton. It's not really hard, but they're sort of like swimmers. So they normally stay in places where it's sort of like mucky or muddy um, or there's hard surfaces. So they have, you know, they're pretty quick when they're swimming. I don't know if you can see them swimming here, but they also have like a hard exoskeleton, um, not too hard like a shell, um, but harder than most other small critters when that helps as a protection for them. Guys. Any other questions? Any, yeah, any other questions from us at the Baylander about isopods, about the, the mud crab here? Oh my gosh, those are so spooky. I'm just like watching them crawl all over your hands, Iris Scott. That was spooky. Uh, so many legs. How many legs does an isopod have? Do you know? I think they have about eight different legs on each side. So they have so <laughs> many legs. Let's see. Yeah, about, I'm going to say about 12. So. Well, you can see, let's get a, let's see if we can get an up close look. We can turn this guy around. He's not, oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. So that, that critter actually kind of reminds me of, do you remember the alien movies? Oh yeah. That looks just like a horror scene from that movie, doesn't it? Oh man. Definitely. But, they are really important to our ecosystem, right? So where exactly, you know, do they lie on the food web? So they're pretty much at the bottom of the food web. So no, normally the smaller critters um, are at the bottom of the food web. So the autotrophs. And so these guys, they basically eat things like detritus um, or small lar lar larvae and things that are in the, a small larvae state. So they're pretty small and fish and critters and even Sometimes crabs can eat these guys, the isopods, that is. Wow. All right. That's really, really cool. Thank you for showing us these isopods and crabs and snails. That's really interesting. And then what do we have here? What am I looking at, Ravina? This is actually another one of my creepy critters. Uh, so this is, it looks like a shark head because it is. So this is a dogfish. Um, so this guy, these guys can literally get to about uh, uh, two feet or so. They're found right here in New York Harbor. And dogfish, they have these like, pretty beautiful, shiny eyes. Um, right now, you can't see it because this guy has been in here for a while. Um, but they're also pretty docile. So they don't grow so big. And this one was found, I believe, somewhere in Brooklyn. So this is a dogfish head, also found in New York Harbor, um, which shows the diversity of small critters from isopods some much larger critters like this dogfish head right here. Wow, that's cool. So you're saying that there are sharks in New York Harbor? There are, there are sharks, there are wells, large animals here coming back to New York Harbor, partially because of the work where folks are cleaning the harbor and because we're doing a much better job at keeping our harbor clean. 
So the more we do with advocacy, making sure that our harbor remains clean, um, the more those animals, large bass, sharks, whales, dolphins are gonna be able to come and use New York Harbor as one of their grounds for swimming and breeding. Wow, I am so excited for the day that I'm just crossing the Brooklyn Bridge on my bike and see a huge whale just reach out the water. That'll be a really exciting day. Um, so I wanna say thank you all at the Baylander for joining us today and showing us all these cards. Thanks everyone. All right. Um, I am going to pass it over to Anne uh, and we're kind of going to introduce our National Science Foundation survey. It's time for us to survey. All right. Yeah. So thank you to Nasia and everyone on the Baylander. That was so spooky. And now it is time for our survey. We at Billion Oyster Project are doing some research along with Pace University and the National Science Foundation. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat and send it to you all. So I just sent it there. And this survey is asking you about what you think about the subjects of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What have you experienced in these subjects? What are you interested or not interested when it comes to careers in these subjects? This is the kind of information that we're collecting. So do us a favor and click on that link and open up the survey. What we're gonna do is walk you through the first couple of pages of the survey. And then we're gonna give you about eight minutes to complete the survey and we're gonna give you some spooky music in the background when you do. All right, so let's see. You can click out of that survey there, Diana, and see if you can use the one in the chat. But the very first question on the survey asks if you're a middle or high school student. So you can click your answer to that Oh yes, thank you, Diana put a better link. Don't forget the HTTPS at the beginning of your links. <laughs> so the first question asks you if you're a middle or high school student. And then the second question asks you about parent or guardian consent. In order for your answers to count, we need your parent or guardian to agree to the survey. So, if there's a parent or guardian there at home, you can click the first circle and have them sign right now. Or if maybe you'll see your parent or guardian later, you can choose the second circle and start the survey right away. So go ahead and make your choice. Another great thing about this survey is that when you complete it and get your parent or guardian signature, you get to download a certificate that shows that you completed a research survey. And you can print this certificate out and hang it on your wall, or you could show it to one of your science teachers. Now you can see if you're looking at our Zoom that we've moved on to the second page. And the second page requires your consent because we're not gonna do this survey unless you agree to it. So you click how old you are, I am 17 years or younger, or I am 18 years or older. And then a white box appears. And you just click on your mouse or your trackpad and squiggle your signature in that white box. <laughs> hey there, Bop. And then you can put the typed name and click Submit. Once you've done that, you're off and running with the actual survey questions. So this survey should take you about eight to 10 minutes. And while you're working on it, we're gonna play a slideshow for you with some more creepy critter images and put some creepy critter music on in the background. We'll check in along the way to see how you're doing and feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. 
here up on the screen, you can see student survey part one. So have fun with the survey and stick around because eight minutes from now, we are going to have a special sneak peek of a new exhibit at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. So don't go away. We'll see you in a minute. So, and there's a few key words in this survey that I think that we should kind of talk about, right? So what exactly is STEM? STEM. S-T-E-M, right? mm -hmm. all capitals. That's right. STEM or stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So those are the subjects and the topics that we're most interested in in this survey, STEM education. But we don't want to forget about arts as well. That's right, Miss Frizzle. Ask your question again, Miss Frizzle. So I saw that on the survey, there's a whole section about being a peer peer. So what exactly is that? Tell me more about Sure. One of the initiatives that Billion Oyster Project is working on is a mentoring program called Near Peer Mentoring, where older students, such as juniors or seniors in high school, get a chance to work with some younger students, like freshmen or middle school students. So if you've ever done any kind of mentoring or you've been mentored by someone else, we're interested to know about that. And we call it near peer mentoring. Awesome. Yeah, so I heard that we have another event upcoming that's in the same vein. So it's a peer event, isn't it? Yes, definitely come and check out our career panel which is all about the subject of vessel operations. One of our partner schools is the New York Harbor School, and they have lots of amazing maritime career programs. So next week, we're going to highlight the vessel operations program. Yeah, that's going to be really exciting. We're going to have panelists who are in the field talking to students such as yourselves that are filling out this survey for us today. I always am fascinated by these American eels with glass eels that go in photo because they are the baby eels. So they're actually transparent. Like you can see their eyeballs, you can see you know, their spines and everything bodies like that and they'll actually change their color over time so if you take a look at this one it's already starting to kind of change color right it's starting to be less glass less transparent and eventually they'll be like green or yellow and you can find them a lot in our um, you know oyster future stations and cabinets and everything else it's really really cool yeah I love these eel pictures, especially that last one. Imagine what it would be like to be in a pool of eels all squirming around you. That's pretty spooky. <laughs> we got a shrimp, uh, and it looks like this one's actually carrying eggs in this photo, which is also uh, really interesting. So, so many under there, that atlas. And it's going to pop out of your hand if you're holding it. I hope that the survey is going okay. Remember, there are no right or wrong answers. We're just interested in what you've done and what you think.
So don't stress about it. Just keep on going. And remember, stick around because we have a sneak peek of a new exhibit at the Brooklyn Children's Museum in just a few minutes. Ooh, there's my favorite creepy critter. The blue crab. I love that blue crab. In case anyone is interested, Miss Frizzle is at our new lab station in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. So if you're ever down near Domino Park, in Williamsburg, come and check out the BOP lab. Where exactly is the lab, Miss Frizzle? So the address is 262 10th Avenue. So if you go to Domino Park and have a nice day in the sun, you can actually walk back on 5th Avenue and there's this really, really big tall building and we're downstairs in that building. So if you come by and visit, you'll be able to see our pumpkins on display right now. I've got a BOP pumpkin over here and a blue crab pumpkin over here. And we've got even more in the window display so you can learn more about the species that are in New York Harbor. Um, and then we also do water quality testing here in this lab. So we'll test for bacteria, which is also super spooky to learn about. But it's a bacteria that's present in the water when, you know, people flush their toilets and everything that's present there. And then it's also present in our harbor. So we want to learn about what's going on in our harbor in these different locations and how safe it is to actually go swimming in them. Uh, so come on by, we'll show you all of our experiments that we've got going on between pumpkins, our water, and then even our oyster research stations, which are increasing our biodiversity. So you can see all of this biodiversity in everything just by looking at our oyster research. We're here on Thursdays and Fridays, if you ever want to pop by. We're here on Thursdays around 11 to 4, and Fridays around 10 to 4. Fantastic. So when you're finished with the survey, don't worry, you can always ask your parents or guardians to sign it later. So when you finish your part, you can just leave that screen open until your folks come home and you can have them sign the parental consent. I have no reflection in a mirror, but my lack of shadow is far queer. I cannot visit without invitation, but let me in and we'll be blood relations. Police to meet you, hope to eat you, I'm Count Dracula. One thing I cannot stand is garlic. My doctor says I'm probably allergic. Do you ever feel like you're doing like hard work? Like, you feel like you're doing, you know, science and you're being a scientist when you're working with our, you know, out in the field? That's a really great question, Miss Frizzle. I know that your books talk about that a lot, <laughs> but. I love being out in the field, just like Tanasia and Ira were there on Baylander. And it is amazing. Once you get your hands on the equipment and you get your hands on the organisms, it just really feels important. And you know that you're part of something bigger when you're collecting data and sharing it with other people and other community scientists.
So I miss going out in the field as much as we used to. Yeah, I agree. I think our slideshow is coming to an end with all of those creepy critters. I hope that folks are working their way through the survey. Remember, if you have any questions, you can pop them, uh, pop them right into uh, the q and I'm looking at the Q&A. So I can answer questions. And I think we're pretty much getting towards the end of our event. And we have a very, very special sneak peek coming up. So Agata, you want to introduce that for us? I mean, Miss Frizzle. So the Philian Oyster Project has been working really hard with the Brooklyn Children's Museum for this amazing, amazing new exhibit. So what we've got for you today is a sneak peek video of what this new exhibit looks like. And you'll be able to see it the next time you go to the Brooklyn Children's Museum. So don't forget to check that out. I believe that they're having a really cool socially distant Halloween event as well. So definitely take a look at their website and find that information there. And then uh, without further ado, here is the video of our new exhibit at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Hooray. Welcome to the Brooklyn Children's Museum's newest exhibit called Oyster City. I am just going to walk you through some of the things that you may see here. This is a live saltwater tank. Look at that guy. This is a diorama of the undersea creatures along with a research station. Here is a cabinet with oyster files which by the way was provided by Billion Oyster Project, along with a dory that was also provided by Billion Oyster Project and the Harbor School. This is our sand play area, along with some taxidermied animals, things that the children can play with. Here is a whale bone, and here is our oyster tank along with great information and pictures of the Billion Oyster Project. I hope you guys enjoy. Wow, that's all right. right. Are you there, Ms. Frizzle? I'm here. Fantastic. So that was the Brooklyn Children's Museum over in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, with a brand new exhibit. So please, I hope that you can uh, get out sometime soon and check it out. Other things that you wanna be sure to check out coming up is uh, New York Harbor School and our near peer career panel that's coming up. So we'll drop some information into the chat if you'd like to check it out. Yeah, so our Near Peer Career Panel is happening really soon. It's happening on Monday. So Anne's going to be dropping that link in our chat box here. So if you're interested or ever wanted to know how to become a vessel operator, how to work with boats but stay on land, how to work on boats in the ocean, how to work on boats you know, in your professional life or even in high school, this is the event for you. This is something to attend to learn more about different ways of getting on the water uh, and also like helping us out with our projects. So that would be really awesome if you can attend. Again, that's on Monday. Uh, so you can register just via Eventbrite the same way that you did for this event. Um, okay, yeah, so there's a question in the chat. What is a vessel? Anne, you wanna take it away? Sure, a vessel is a general word for pretty much any kind of boat on the water. And there's a lot that goes into learning how to be on the water in terms of safety and navigation. And so this topic of vessel operations covers not just driving boats, but everything about operating them. So the folks at this career panel coming up 
I have a variety of, ba of backgrounds and are a variety of ages. So they're gonna give a really good overview of what it means to drive a boat in New York Harbor. And Anne, let me ask you something. Is it all males that are usually driving these boats? Well, traditionally the industry has been very male oriented, but all of our career panels are gonna feature people of diverse backgrounds and more and more we're seeing women in important positions in and around the harbor. So we will have both uh, male and female, old and young participants in this coming career panel. That's really exciting. And I know that they're all alumni of the Harbor School. So the New York Harbor School, or not all, but many of them are alumni of the New York Harbor School. So what's really cool is that you can learn not only about your future career paths, but you could also learn about the New York Harbor School. So if you're interested uh, in uh, high school and you're still thinking about which one to go, this is also a great event to kind of expose yourself to the marine industry, right? Absolutely. So the career panel on Monday uh, is geared towards those of you who are in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Uh, we encourage anyone to come, but that's who it's designed for. So. And we're also going to have uh, career panels coming throughout the entire year on different topics and different careers around New York Harbor. Things like engineering, marine biology, and aquaculture. So stay tuned. Check back in with Billy and Oyster Project. Thank you so much for being here for our creepy critters. Hope you have a fun and safe weekend. And we'll see you soon. Thank you all. Thanks, Miss Frizzle.